I think it's time in, in the program to, to change language once again, as we often do here at Samlings Forum, because I have the great privilege to welcome Joachim Huber, from the, who is an art historian and co-managing director of the company Prev Art. And we really look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you very much. Thank um, Good after dag. Is that okay? In my dialect, it would be grüßer, very short and quick. So, um, keep the balance is my topic today. In German, it's even um, a little bit more prosaic. How much culture is enough? So, a few years ago, there was a publication in German um, called the um, Cultural Infarctus. And the subtitle was um, Everywhere the Same and Too Much of Everything. And I took this um, subtitle as an introduction. Is it really the way that we have uh, our museums nowadays? And, of course, the, the context makes the sense of an object. Of an object if it is um, design, or if it is um, a specimen of um, Swiss precision technique, or if it is a journalist um, typing on a typewriter in the war, or Ho Chi Minh writing his political statements. Always the context makes the sense of an object. But not every object makes sense everywhere. In this case here, it makes sense because it's in a very small village in the Alps called Pachins. But where, why are there these um, typewriters? The, one of the inventors of the typewriters in the 19th century lived in this small village. He left, he returned after in his late life and um, was absolutely unknown, forgotten. And perhaps for this small village in the Alps, these typewriters are sort of a memoria of their noble prize worthy people in their village. So every collection needs a policy. We can't have a collection, a real collection, without a policy. We need one. And the policy, in my opinion, is something which is focused to the future, not to the past. We should look forward, not backward, in creating our policy for collections. We should focus the strength of the collections and eliminating its weaknesses. And we should create, by creating a collection policy, a sort of confidence in the institution, in the collection, to, be, to go f uh, further on and to enlarge the uh, impact of this collection. So, back to my um, specific interest, what is a storage facility? It's very simple. A storage facility is above all um, a repository and for heritage objects, nothing more. It's not an exhibition. It provides reasonable protection to cultural heritage, and sometimes it has also a facade, which is quite nice, as you see in Munich on the left side. But we have three major challenges, challenges for the heritage preservation in the future. One, known to everybody, is the climate change, which will have a huge impact on our doing. The second is the question about resources we need for our museums, storages, what else. And, and it's not yet very well known, that we have a huge contamination within museums on the objects, which we will have to cope with in the near future, reason that safety for um, our members and uh, workers. First, the climate change. Um, the termites, they arrived already in Paris. They are e eating woods in Paris. 
And I wonder when they will arrive in Scandinavia in a future time. Or we had in 2050 a flooding in a um, church treasury in Switzerland where the whole church treasure was underwater for three days, which is really a sad thing. Second is, we have to think about um, the resources we need and we use. The resources thought of as land, as material, as energy, energy consumption, and of course also, and very often a problem in museums, money. And the third thing is the contamination of the objects, mainly by pesticides, but also we have um, volatile particles coming in, in the museum and storage facilities, which um, are a big problem and uh, affect uh, big costs. So, what are our storages nowadays? On the left-hand side, we have an um, archive tower in one of the Swiss um, cantons, an archive for centuries, no heating, no he humidifying, no dehumidifying, it's just working fine. On the right side, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, a building of um, rather suspicious um, impact on the objects. This, what you see here, are the storages, not the working spaces. The working spaces are below underground. So, what have we, or what kind of, of strategies did we have in the past? What have we today? And where will we hopefully go to? In the past, we had intelligent locations. The um, church um, of Valeria and Valis they knew where to put the archive, just on top of a mountain. Never flooded, never burned, still there. Nowadays, it's more or less everything goes, do what you like, the technology will fetch it. It's the chocolate museum in Cologne, but what you see as brown mass around the museum is not chocolate, but it's the Rhine flooding the museum a few years ago. So, what we need in future are intelligent location choice. Outside high risk zones, Swiss people like to build storage facilities within the water. I don't. We have also the question of durability of materials. Massive and simple construction in the past, but nowadays it's fancy to have composite systems, sophisticated systems, but very high tech and very expensive in maintenance. And in the future, we still have to go back, in my opinion, to durable materials, durable systems, and I call it an intelligent low tech. So, in the past we had little maintenance, simple maintenance, nowadays we have huge um, uh, machineries, complex machineries, where you only can replace whole components and not single parts. And in the future, we have, again, I think, a situation where we need repairable um, situations, repairable machines. In the past, we didn't have any standards, no EC standards, no national standards, nothing. It's just the pure um, knowledge of people which was used in these days. They had passive climate, natural ventilation, as you see on this building, with these ventilation towers in Iran, still functioning nowadays, but several hundred years old. So now, or for the last 50 or 60 years, active climate control was the topic for museum and storage facility. I think it will be changing quite drastically in the future because we don't have the money to run them anymore. So we need again a situation which is built on experience and not mainly on technology. Of course, energy is a question. And nowadays, 
we had in the 70s and 80s buildings which were uh, uh, consuming a huge amount of petrol to run them and to operate these highly sophisticated systems. And I would like to go to the future for storage facilities, for example, to have a passive uh, system which has apps on the overall year uh, zero situation, no uh, energy input. So I um, propose 10 um, uh, approaches for sustainable facilities. First of all, and I say that because I'm, I think it's really important, we need, before we start thinking about storage facilities, we need a, 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 a collection policy. No storage without policy. Why do we collect? <coughs> what is the aim of the institution? Where we intend to go? How does an object come in the collection? How it can out of the collection? And most important, and I, I emphasize this, we should also say what we do not collect. It's much more important to have a statement on what we are not collecting in the policy than what we really want to collect. Because you need the collection policy to discuss with people who would like to give you something you really don't want. So a museum and a storage is definitely no flea market. Keep only what is worth to be kept. I know this is quite difficult to decide, but anyway, I think we should try to decide something, not to abandon any um, kind of decision in our museums. Even if it's a fault or a mistake, in the f for nowadays, but perhaps on the overall side, it's the right decision. We should also look at overall the risk. Risk is not only climate or theft or um, uh, burning a, a whole storage facility. It's the whole as a, as a, as a a system we have to look, and we have to look to minimize the overall um, um, object risk just in, in, in the intention to minimize uh, risks and have a long-term preservation. Nowadays, the present planning horizon, I say, is about four or five years. It's less than a politician can think. And I personally, I'm very in favor of a thinking over 100 years, perhaps. 100 years is just four generations. It's more than we can remember. It's more than our grand-grandparents. Uh, but I think we have to think about what do we do actually nowadays in order to have the most relevant part of our collection in 100 years' time? not tomorrow, not in a week's time, but in a hundred years' time. It might be closing parts of the collection, dividing up a collection to be able to survive, to give this the, the, the possibility to survive for the collection for the fusion, future as a whole. And also, this Horizon 100 can be thought of as a geographic um, um, topic to think about, is it really necessary to have a sewing machine every 10 th kilometers the same, or might it be a, a, a point to work together between museums? In German, we would say we should look a little bit further than the rim of our saucer. And the intention in all this is to do the best with the money we have. Do something that helps to, for the future, that helps the most for the collection in 100 years' time, not for tomorrow. Realistic climate specification is a huge topic in, in storage facility um, talking. And I think it's just a question optimizing instead of maximizing. In the last decades, we did always maximize the situation with highly sophisticated technique, 
but we didn't optimize him on, on long term. Everybody here in the hall has um, had the experience of very cold and very hot climate. But the comfort zone for human beings is very, very narrow. It's only between 18 and 22 degrees, perhaps. Very narrow. But if we have a look at different points where art has a problem with climate, and I say not that we have specific objects that need specific climate, but the, the majority of the objects doesn't have these very specific needs. So, for example, you have certain um, um, materials which don't like to be stored below 13, 15 degrees. Others don't like to be stored above um, 25 degrees. I don't say we can heat now or we can cool now, but I say we should broaden the view about the things. Also knowing that um, a difference in temperature of 8 to 10 degrees centigrade accelerates or doubles mostly, almost, the um, decay of uh, an object. So we should look at a little bit less um, uh, strict this, these questions, perhaps even further down, because many objects don't say anything, don't crack if you go down, when you look after the humidity, of course. And the humidity is the second parameter, or the, even the more important parameter in this question. And normally we are talking about 50, 45 to 55, but probably we should more uh, think about um, 40 to 60. And we will see that this is not really a problem. The problem is if you go above, when you have mold, or you go even lower down, and you have a drying out of the object and distortion of the objects. So if you look, in the center you have these um, adequate standards we are always talking about between 45 to, to, um, to 55 and 18 to 22 degrees. It's human comfort, it's not object comfort. So we might think more in, in a, in a um, less strict way about this, even further down. Realistic means also that we have fluctuations we should try to avoid. This is made just by um, Photoshop, but that's how you persuade somebody that it's really dangerous in your collection. And this is the average fluctuation you see here, but probably you would rather like it this way around. Over the year, it might softly fluctuate a little bit. So the thing is, we would like less heating, less cooling, less humidifying, less hum dehumidifying. And this means also less maintenance. I know that it's not always possible not in every climate possible, but we should thrive to this direction. And priority, of course, has always the climate stability. So when we see this, it's also clear that we should shift from an active climatization or air conditioning to passive systems, which would also be um, much less um, resource needed. One point I think is really important. We shouldn't free for 100% best practice. That's impossible and costs a huge amount of money. We should try to do our best for 95% and just take compromises or special solutions for the rest of the 5%. If we take 100%, we will never reach that. But these 95% we can reach. One point is also that we always um, take for granted that only the most expensive is the best for the objects. On the left side, you, left hand side, you have um, these meshes for pictures, which are about five times as expensive as the situation on the right side, 
where you have a less sophisticated system. But for your second or third class object, maybe this is still uh, an improvement uh, compared to nowadays. I think also that we should try to be as compact as possible in order to have a situation, a storage facility, which has the least possible volume we have to look after, and also to minimize the footprint and the energy consumption. Then, very important, to protect our staff, we can't use any more um, toxic substances in, um, in uh, pest management. It's absolutely out of um, doing this nowadays. But therefore, we need to introduce from the beginning on um, an IPM, an integrated pest management system, to have, before we have an infestation, uh, uh, a possibility to control the environment and the situation within our storage facilities. And I have personally one more goal. You see there um, this little cow, it's a souvenir, quite known in Switzerland, it's industrial. Um, but anyhow, it represents something simple. And I think we should also try to regain a little bit humility and modesty in our thinking about our cultural heritage. Because if you see this cow, it's not sitting al alone in a storage facility, but it has around, around um, a, a green, it has nature around. And we are just part of a whole system, a whole world, a whole living world. So, I personally, I have a dream. I would like museum directors to create sustainable strategies for their institution. That they try to, to show what they are for. What is the intention of the institution? Why are we collecting what we are collecting? I would like the curators to create reasonable collection policies. Policies which also allow for the future some changements, which allow to improve our collection, which allow also to release objects from the collection. But, but always with the intention to do it better and to facilitate it for the future to work with our collections. I would like to have the, the conservators to ask for reasonable uh, conditions especially um, climate conditions. I'm married to a conservator, so I can be a little bit nasty about that. But I think we cannot afford what we did in the last decades. And I know already a few museums which did shut down their um, uh, air conditioning systems. And the architects, they are also asked they are asked for simple buildings, buildings which still work when energy is cut off. They still work in 40 years or 50 years, not only today at the opening or tomorrow. And of course, I would like also the visitors, and I include visitors to people who have a right to see what is in the, in the, in the storage facilities. We had the opening of the a new storage facility in, in Innsbruck, in Hull, in September, and we had in one afternoon 3,000 people who were asking to see what is inside this um, storage facility. So, how much cultural heritage is enough? Is it really um, worth that every 10 kilometers we have a dozen sewing machines, or typewriters, or toasters, all the same, everywhere. On the left-hand side, it's a rural museum in Switzerland. On the right-hand side, it's a recently refurbished storage facility in Germany. 
but basically they have more or less the same objects. Too much of all and everything the same? It's up to you to decide, I think. No, no, I, I'm not so nasty. I think it's up to us to tackle this mission and to improve the situation with our cultural heritage for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. That was superb. Uh, I think talking about collection policies, that is music to our ears. Uh, everybody's nodding here. We talk a lot about it this, these days. And I can tell you in the audience that there will be a, a workshop tomorrow. Uh, and lucky you who are going to that one. It's a collection of basic collection quantity data for storage planning. Uh, so those of you who have signed up for that, I envy you. Uh, your presentation will also, there's a link on the Samlings Forum website to your presentation because we haven't time to, to, <laughs> to take all the details there. So, um, uh, you're talking a little about disposal. So, you, would a disposal policy go hand in hand then with a collection policy, would you say? Or shall we have two different policies there? I think that a disposal policy is always integral part of a collection policy. But now it's, I say something which I shouldn't say, but um, it is cheaper to build bigger storage than to de-access objects. So, in my opinion, we shouldn't try, to, we should not look back and say, oh, we should all make these deaccessioning um, um, procedures. We should look forward to look that the next generation doesn't have the same problems as we have with our ancestors with collections. Mm. So the better the objects are documented and also the better the, the, the choice of the objects entering a collection nowadays, the better for uh, the future generation. Mm. Uh, open storage facilities, that is not one of your favorites or? Um, no, because um, I, open storage, if you mean a sort of a, uh, where you an exhibition it. where yes. you can go inside, it's just a tight exhibition, it's not a storage. You still need about five times as much space for an open storage than you would need for a, a normal storage. And the point is also that people really like to go in the storage behind the scene. It's a sort of wireism uh, going to these storage facilities because people think, I can see something what others can't see. And that's the point why they are so interested in going it. And I personally, I don't have any problem with people going behind the scene to see storage facilities. Of course, there are certain uh, conditions. But I, I think it's, it's public money invested in, in storage facilities. And we should, in a certain way also give access to the public. Mm. Thank you. Do we have any questions from our beloved audience here? Uh, we have, you know, in this audience we have uh, museum directors, we have curators, we have conservators, and we're all visitors, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all represented there. Uh, uh, one problem that I've come across is that um, some people, they, they tend to, this is my collection, you know, it could be the entomological collection or the, the cars or the, the clothing, uh, the textiles, etc. So sometimes it can be hard to come to an, an agreement within one organization because there are different interests. Have you come across this when, 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 when trying to keep the balance, so to speak? <laughs> it's, it's in fact a big problem, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's a big problem problem in, in how people um, behave and think about their collection. And I think this is also changing. The more, more and more we have facilities which integrate also conservation, curatorial um, um, uh, work space with the collection themselves. And if you don't allow all these um, particular groups to have their own social room, mm then you will probably manage in a few years' time to, to, to create a common 
uh, uh, community within the storage. We have seen that in, in Zurich, for example, we have seen that now uh, in Hall in Innsbruck, um, where people really love to work together and to, to exchange the, the entomologist with the historian, the art historian with, with the archaeologist. And this makes it, in it interesting. And yeah. I think the future is to collaborate because yeah. we can't afford to work against each other because the money is, is short. Yeah, it's the economy stupid, yeah. as they say. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm also, uh, do we have a question here? I'm afraid to take your... Uh, yeah. We have time for, for... I can still continue here, Lisa. Yes, because you, you touched on my favorite subject, IPM, and uh, it's integrated pest management, some or not Skadjurs control, for those of you who, who know. Uh, you, you really uh, put that high on, on, your, on your agenda. Uh, that is very interesting because it's not... We, we start to talk about it more and more now in Sweden, but it's not been on, on the top of the agenda, so to speak, when talking about uh, collection care. It's, it's just a question what I showed with this um, leverage um, on, on the euro or, or crown or whatever you, you have as a, as a currency. Mm. It's, it's to use the single dollar or euro the best, and then it's probably better invested in a good IPM than in a nice um, facade, which is uh, the, the thing for the architects and not for the object. Yeah. Although I must say, um, a storage facility which looks like a, 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 um, a deep freezing house is not a good um, uh, visit card for the museum. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you talk about architects, I think about there's this architect Liebskind, I think his name is. You know, we, we love to hate him in a way because <laughs> they're not, not a straight angle anywhere. So, you know, for IPM, etc., cleaning, housekeeping, it's very difficult. The, the more. Mm, known internationally an architect is, the more difficult it is for me to work with them. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not surprised. Well, well, no, we have a question here, sorry, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm Erika, working at the Swedish National Heritage Board. Thank you very much, it was really interesting to hear about your dream and I think I want to share it. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about how, how, do you have any idea how to get it come through and how to, you mentioned cooperation, but also I think maybe communication, how, how do you know any idea how to, to get this and how to start to communicate these things in the museums and make it happen? Um, to, to, to talk about, to, to make workshops about different aspects <laughs> to, to that and one thing I think the, the, the cultural um, community has a problem that they have to work together with the, the, the building, um, what do you call it, the building, uh, uh, not society, the, 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 no, not the construction company, the... Um, Say it in German, I try to translate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Das Bauamt. Bygnads, Bygnadsnämnden. Bygnadsnämnden och and Bygnads, uh, Bygnadsförvaltningen. If the museums don't prepare their demands in a perfect way, they risk to get laughed on because it's not the quality they are used to have in preparation for such a project. And if you have any project in a museum, storage facility, or whatever, the better you are prepared, the better you can discuss with all the others, also the architects, the, the engineers. And I say that if an architect or an engineer is asking you something about climate condition, about security, about anything you want, you must take a sheet and give it instantly to him. If you have to look after the information to give to him, you are two weeks late. So you, you should go preactive in such a project and try to anticipate what is coming as, as question to the institution. And the better you are prepared, the better you are off. 
Yes, did we have more questions from the audience? Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, while you are going to the uh, and getting the microphone, maybe I am allowed to ask a question. I appreciated your uh, presentation with the with the different uh, thoughts, the directors, the curators, and so on. But I was missing someone. That was the politicians. What are you saying about them? Because they are sitting on the money. What do you I, I, what what do you what do you recommend for them? I, I didn't miss them. I didn't miss them. Okay. Because um, I, I was talking about a hundred years um, uh, horizon, and they are only within four years. That's the okay, but time can, they can think can, about. How can how can how can we manage? How can we manage to get them to think in one in, in about twenty five or fifty years horizons, you, you, and you not not talk, in your mandate period? You have to talk with the politician who is elected, who wants to be. Um, at an opening of a thing. So never start a project at the end of an electing period of a politician. That's one thing. <laughs> and the other thing is, if you can start at the beginning of his, his period, then he will be interested that you will have a result within four years. And it's the same as for the architects and, and the, the engineers. You need to be prepared. And the first time you are lost in, in, in being able to answer, you have lost the project. Okay, thank you. We have a question over there. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Teresa Meskett, um, Modern Museet. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of examples of um, institutions that have uh, their materials, uh, for example, film in, in cold storage in uh, uh, former mines. And uh, I'm I'm, I'm wondering if you have examples of um, consortiums that um, have succeeded in integrating uh, different museums and, and other institutions' um, uh, collections in, in cold storage. And uh, this would involve, <laughs> I think, that, that uh, politicians' level and the institutional level. Um, but it, it seems like that would be viable for a lot of um, smaller institutions, too. Um, first of all, I must say that, unfortunately, the, the German-speaking area, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria, has still enough money to make se separate um, um, projects for separate institutions. They still don't really work together, many institutions. It's more the Netherlands and more the Scandinavian um, countries doing that. that I, must, I must say that. Um, but it's coming more and more. And it's also a, a question of mentality to share things and not to, to fear that the other would touch my objects. I have a project, or I had a project, where we had furniture of four different uh, institutions, and they didn't want to have them stored in one room. And we have to, to get to the point where we work together. It's not their cultural heritage. It's our cultural heritage. And as long as we look after the object, it's, it's OK to work together. And in my opinion, it's the only way to go. And it's also for specific um, things like film or, or, um, or specific which needs objects which need specific climate situa situations to take them out of an institution, perhaps to have a better situation at another institution, not to collect everything in every uh, institution. But it's still a question to persuade others that we are working together for our cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Did we have more questions? Or, yeah, it's time to stop. Yeah, fine. Well, then, Joachim, okay. many, many thanks, and we will get your gift there. <laughs>